speaker is Gennady Shved, who, as you can judge by the title, uh, pretty much lives the dream of this workshop of taking all the buzzwords from all the areas and applying them to, uh, to another buzzword. <laughs> well, that's a slightly ambiguous introduction, but... Uh, but <laughs> But, but thank you anyway. <laughs> yeah, so first of all, I would like to uh, uh, thank the organizers for inviting me to this meeting. It's been very exciting. So uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this talk, I won't be talking uh, about atoms, but I will be talking about some meta-atoms. So this is basically uh, an attempt to emulate some of the atomic physics phenomena <clears throat> which many of you are probably much better familiar with than, than I am, such as uh, final resonances and uh, 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 topological phenomena and so on, uh, to emulate them in photonics as opposed to uh, doing it with real atoms. And uh, uh, I guess uh, uh, one uh, buzzword that I haven't used, maybe I should have used it, is the mesoscale. So as uh, you are going to see, Metamaterials are actually mesoscale materials, and this is, uh, uh, yeah, hopefully the, the, the picture says it all. And uh, 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 on a mesoscale, as it turns out, we can do certain things that are very difficult to accomplish uh, on, a, uh, on an atomic level. Okay, so just to remind you, there was already one talk uh, on metamaterials from uh, uh, Vlad Shalayev, but uh, I'll just uh, uh, review this for you. So, uh, metamaterial, the, uh, the first uh, part is meta, so that means beyond, and uh, even if you're not familiar with metamaterials, you've probably heard about metaphysics, so that's a bad thing, uh, because nothing can go beyond nature. But uh, metamaterials are not attempting to do something unnatural. In fact, uh, uh, they're simply trying to engineer properties of uh, 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 various structures, which could be mechanical structures, electrical structures, optical structures, to accomplish certain functionalities that you cannot easily achieve with, uh, uh, <coughs> with the materials that we have at hand. And, uh, 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 for example, Vlad already talked about uh, making hyperbolic uh, 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 metamaterials with hyperbolic dispersion. He also mentioned negative refraction. So negative refraction is also something that we cannot really uh, accomplish uh, uh, with uh, regular materials, uh, uh, exactly for the reason that I mentioned. Uh, one has to go to mesoscale in order to accomplish this functionality. And this is, in fact, where the whole field actually got its start, uh, with people trying to achieve in a, a microwave range uh, negative refraction. So this is sort of a prototypical metamaterial. Uh, things have become a little bit uh, uh, more sophisticated since then, but not that much, because most of the effort has actually been towards moving towards uh, optical uh, frequencies, and at optical frequencies you can't really make very complex shapes. So uh, believe it or not, after so many years of uh, research in metamaterials, a split ring resonator or some sort of an analog of that still remains more or less a workhorse of, uh, uh, of the metamaterials field. So in any case, this is a very uh, uh, rich field and I'm going to concentrate only on one narrow aspect of it. How can we use metamaterials to emulate certain quantum mechanical phenomena? Uh, and I will just uh, be very specific. I will talk about emulating FANO interferences and how we can use FANO interferences to uh, accomplish uh, uh, subdiffraction imaging, which could be something of interest to, to this uh, uh, community because it would be interesting to be able to, for example, locate ions with very high uh, precision inside optical cavities. And, uh, and so on. And then I will talk uh, about topological insulators, which is a very interesting and uh, emerging area in condensed matter physics. And it turns out that even with photons, you can uh, uh, accomplish uh, topological insulation. It's a little bit uh, different because uh, a spin degree of freedom, which is just a given for an electron, is not something that's uh, easy to emulate in optics. It actually requires a little bit of an effort and uh, 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 it's a little bit contrived, but once you've contri uh, successfully contrived uh, to do this, you can actually get lots of interesting functionalities and I will talk about them. Okay, so this is just a general chart that shows that 
metamaterials can beat regular uh, uh, materials at their own game in a sense that uh, uh, it can emulate some of the effects that we know from uh, regular atomic physics. For example, we can make uh, clusters of uh, plasmonic particles that have optical response corresponding to, for example, zero electric dipole moment transition. So these are the so-called uh, uh, magnetic atoms. This is the work that was done in collaboration with Federico Capasso, uh, actually here, up the, uh, uh, up the road. And uh, one can also develop very interesting metamaterials that exhibit what we call uh, double fan or resonance. So this double fan or resonance allows us to have very strange dispersion relations. So this is a uh, curve, this is a dependence of frequency on the wave number. And as you can see, it has a flat, port, uh, a flat section corresponding to slow light, which is immersed in a very broad uh, uh, spectrum. So having a dispersion relation like that allows us to have very broad uh, slow light in uh, metamaterial structures. Uh, moreover, uh, the uh, diagnostics of these uh, uh, metamaterials is becoming better and better. So for example, it is still a little bit difficult to visualize a wave function of an electron, even though we heard uh, 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 a great talk by uh, Louis who, who, who showed some uh, uh, possibilities how we can try and visualize uh, uh, um, <clears throat> Schrodinger functions of electrons, but with metamaterials, uh, you can actually visualize electromagnetic modes of these structures using near field scanning optical microscopy. So it is possible, for example, to observe phenomena such as uh, uh, toggling when uh, uh, you change the frequency and the distribution of electric field changes dramatically uh, in a structure. So, so, so these are not uh, simulations, these are actual experimental results. Yes. Okay, so, so this is a great question, especially since I will not be talking about double fano, so, so let me <laughs> sort of get it out of the way. So, so by, by double fano, I should have been a little bit more uh, precise. This is a double continuum fano. So that means that uh, a discrete level actually is coupled to two modes of the continuum. And, uh, uh, you know, if you read Fano's paper, it's all uh, laid out, uh, uh, you know, section by section. Two discrete modes, one continuum mode, one discrete mode, two uh, continuum modes, and so on and so forth. And uh, we, we can realize these sorts of structures with metamaterials because, for example, light has two uh, polarizations. So in principle, one can have a, a discrete state which is coupled to both polarizations of light. Okay, so, so this is what I meant by uh, double fan. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> let me, since we started talking about FANO, let me just remind you where this uh, uh, phenomenon is coming from. So, uh, 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 obviously, it's, it's named after uh, Hugo FANO, okay, who described, uh, uh, wh whose goal was basically to describe ionization of a helium atom, either by x-rays or by a fast uh, uh, passing electron. And his goal was uh, essentially to explain why these uh, uh, ionization spectra do not look like a Lorentzian, a narrow Lorentzian spectrum, or just a broad continuum spectrum, but in fact they have a strange kind of a non-monotonic dependence of, uh, 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 of uh, 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 ionization cross-section on the electron energy. And what he was uh, uh, able to figure out is that the reason for that is a quantum interference of two possible pathways of ejecting an electron from a bound state from here uh, onto a continuum. So he realized that there are two ways of doing it. You can just directly uh, uh, push an electron out into the continuum by a fast uh, X-ray or an electron as long as the energy of an electron is larger than the ionization potential. You can also do it through a process of uh, uh, auto-ionization uh, 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 where two electrons are actually transferred to an excited level and then one of them through Auger process uh, goes back into the ground state and then the second one gets kicked out. So this process is not a continuum energy process because you actually have to match the energy of a uh, uh, transfer to the, uh, to the electrons to the transition energy between the ground state and the excited state. So when you uh, 
add these two uh, processes together, taking their phases into account, you can get this uh, characteristic Fano spectrum, which is named uh, after him. So as you can see, he's smiling uh, very broadly. Uh, he, uh, his paper is actually one of the most influential uh, 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 atomic physics uh, papers of the 20th century, at least if you judge by the uh, citations, and uh, he actually lived a long life to, uh, to see that. Uh, what I'm going to be focusing on is how fan resonances can be realized in uh, uh, photonic systems, specifically in meta-atoms, meta-materials. Uh, uh, meta and it turns out that uh, 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 there is a simple way of doing it. So all you need to do is to come up with some sort of a meta-molecule or a collection, for example, of plasmonic particles that supports multiple resonances. So one of these resonances I'm going to classify as a bright resonance, and the reason for it is because uh, it has a strong uh, <clears throat> electric dipole moment, okay? So all uh, polarizabilities, uh, all, all dipole moments of these spheres are directing in the same direction. So that means that this mode is very strongly coupled to the uh, outside world, to the incident light, and uh, therefore it is very broad. It represents a very broad uh, resonance because uh, the uh, width of the spectrum is actually proportional to the square of the coupling of the, uh, uh, of the system to the uh, incident light. But there are other uh, resonances as well, and some of them can be classified as dark because their uh, electric dipole moment is actually nearly vanishing. Okay? So, for example, if you have uh, two uh, spheres polarized in this direction and two polarized in the other direction, then their total dipole moment is uh, zero, but when you bring them very close to each other, they acquire a very small dipole uh, moment through their uh, near-field interaction, and this is exactly what's reflected in this uh, 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 extinction spectrum. So you have a broad spectrum with a characteristic uh, kink, which, uh, which is uh, basically due to uh, Fana interference. So this resonance uh, uh, can be very sharp, and uh, uh, I'm going to show how we can use this phenomena to do subdiffraction uh, uh, imaging. So this will be the first uh, uh, part of the talk. So I will talk about a very simple system, a very simple metamolecule. It consists of a plasmonic sphere and a collection of quantum dots on the surface of the sphere. So as it turns out, using Fano interferences, we can actually pinpoint where these uh, uh, quantum dots are located on the surface of a sphere in a far field measurement, which is quite interesting because this can be done with uh, nanometer precision and doesn't require any kind of a uh, near field optics. So we, we haven't actually done the experiments with uh, quantum dots. This is still something in progress, but we have done in collaboration with, uh, with my colleague uh, uh, at UT, Elaine Lee, a slightly different experiment where a plasmonic uh, nanosphere is rolled on top of a uh, plasmonic rod. So this plasmonic rod is, uh, 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 does not scatter at the uh, visible light, so there's no way to identify it or to find it. Uh, using optical measurements. You can uh, find it, for example, just doing this uh, 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 topography, but uh, uh, even that doesn't help you when you roll the uh, 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 plasmonic nanosphere on top of it. So you can see almost like a, a, a person under a truck, right? So there are some, some uh, uh, legs are sticking out, but you have no idea what's going on under the truck. So it turns out that uh, uh, utilizing Fano resonances, we can actually exactly point out where the contact point of the nanorod is and how this uh, nanorod is oriented with respect uh, to the uh, surface. Okay, so this will be the first part of the talk. And in the second part of the talk, I will uh, go back to this concept of mesoscopic uh, 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 nature of metamaterials and show how we can use what is called bionisotropic metamaterials. I will explain uh, uh, later what bionisotropic means. It's basically uh, uh, metamaterials with a broken symmetry that have uh, a strong magnetoelectric coupling how we can use these sorts of metamaterials to develop uh, <clears throat> topologically protected uh, states that can travel around various zigzags and uh, around various impurities without uh, any backscattering. Okay, so, so this is the uh, first part of the talk. Uh, uh, 
on using uh, uh, final resonances. And, uh, you know, just a very brief uh, 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 preview. Uh, you can imagine that, uh, uh, for example, if you have some kind of a structure, it could be quantum dots, it could be a nanorod in, co uh, in contact with a nanosphere, depending on how you illuminate the structure and what is the polarization of the scattered light, you may see a fan of feature or you may not see. So you can actually use the existence and the strengths of the fan of feature to figure out the geometry of, uh, uh, of a system. Okay, so uh, this, is, this is a slide that basically explains why fan resonances are very interesting. So uh, if, I, if I wanted to put it in a single sentence, I would simply say that fan interference can brighten very small objects, okay? So those small objects could be a quantum dot, it could be an atom, so by placing a quantum dot, for example, in close proximity to a metallic nanoparticle, we can tremendously enhance scattering, which is produced by this quantum dot. So this is a very simple example. We, uh, it, it's, it's just a calculation. We assume that we have a small quantum dot with a diameter of six nanometers, and we look at its uh, scattering, okay? Of course, as you know, very small objects do not scatter, okay? So basically, the radiative uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, width is proportional to the cube of the size of a nano object. So if you have a nano object which is that small, well, it produces a tiny little blip in scattering. Okay. Now, what happens when you bring this uh, uh, quantum dot in the proximity of a much larger scatterer? It turns out that uh, uh, the uh, uh, scattering, which is due to the presence of this uh, quantum dot, can be enhanced by several orders of magnitude. Okay. So without a quantum dot, you would have a very strong scattering from the nanoparticle itself. But when you add it, you produce this little fan of kink, which even though it looks small, it is actually almost three orders of magnitude larger than what uh, a quantum dot by itself would produce. Okay? And the reason for that is a very strong uh, uh, coupling coefficient between the uh, quantum dot and the uh, uh, nanoparticle. So this is sort of a, uh, a coupling regime where the, uh, uh, this enhancement in scattering cross-section can be tremendously larger than the scattering by the rod. Right, it's, it, it's a quantum dot in a very restrictive sense. It's a, uh, it's a small dielectric uh, object which has this excitonic uh, dielectric permittivity. So there, is no, there are no quantum effects per se that I'm talking about. So all, uh, uh, basically the excitonic dynamics in the quantum dot are modeled by this uh, very simple uh, macroscopic uh, permittivity. Uh, also, uh, yeah. Yes, yes, Los losses are taken into account, right. Mm -hmm. um, this, this coupling strength is that, can you assume that it's always that big if it's, if it's if the nanoparticles? It, uh, uh, it, 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 it depends very strongly on the spacing, okay? So this actually assumes, I think, 1.5 nanometers uh, separation between the quantum dot and the uh, nanoparticle. Right, right, and uh, uh, so, so uh, it's, uh, it, 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 it's, uh, it, it's a relatively small uh, metallic particle, so uh, right. Uh, but uh, uh, let, me, uh, let me just see. Uh, okay, so you, you can actually read it off from, from this chart. So this is the uh, gamma, this is the radiative kind of lifetime, inverse of radiative lifetime for a nanoparticle itself. And this is what you get from radiation, right? So in terms of losses, I mean, it's uh, at least an order of magnitude more than radiative coupling. So uh, ohmic losses are tremendous here, right? So most of this width is actually ohmic losses. But there is enough uh, radiative uh, coupling. And in fact, it's many orders of magnitude larger than uh, uh, coupling of the quantum dot itself, okay? So, uh, so let us, uh, uh, let's see what happens when instead of having one quantum dot, you actually have uh, uh, multiple quantum dots. And when you uh, change the polarization of incident light on this uh, uh, system. So in this particular case, we have two quantum dots with uh, 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 
exotonic frequencies at uh, 550 and uh, 570. So what you see is that multiple fan resonances start emerging, but uh, actually where they emerge or where they are strong depends on the polarization of incident light. In other words, if you are tracking quantum dot A, your light would have to be polarized in this direction in order to give a strong fan feature. And if you are tracking the second uh, uh, quantum dot, you would actually have to polarize your light uh, this way. So this is a very intriguing possibility that, in fact, you can have multiple labels, you can have multiple nano objects on top of one uh, 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 metallic nanoparticle, and in a far field experiment, you would be able to somehow figure out where they're uh, located by uh, changing the polarization of incident light and looking at the spectra and at the magnitude of the fan uh, uh, feature. So, so that's the key, tracking the magnitude of the uh, fan feature. So, uh, you know, to understand this mathematically is relatively simple. So uh, if we imagine that uh, the contact point between the uh, uh, nanoparticle and the quantum dot is along the x uh, direction, then we can, we can introduce a polarizability of this uh, combined system. And this polarizability is going to have some uh, kind of trivial and boring uh, components which correspond to electric field being uh, in this direction, which means that the quantum dot does not see any fields, and a non-trivial portion, which uh, happens when the electric field is uh, directed uh, towards, uh, uh, towards the quantum dot. So if we can somehow rotate the polarization of incident light and track the magnitude of this fan feature, we can actually figure out where the quantum dot is. And uh, uh, I call this... Uh, 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 this whole uh, approach, polarization uh, spectrotomography. So why is it uh, tomography? Well, imagine, uh, I'll just remind you what tomography is. So let's imagine that we have a bunch of uh, uh, toys, right? And we simply project them onto a plane. Well, we will, we will know that there are these uh, shapes inside the box, but we will have no idea how they're located with respect to each other. So likewise, if we have a system like this and we just illuminate them with unpolarized light and collect scattering radiation, we will see some uh, fun of feature and we will be able to conclude that yes, there is a large uh, metallic nanoparticle and there is a small quantum dot that uh, has a, a, a exotonic resonance uh, where the fun resonance is, but we will have no idea how they're uh, located with respect to each other. On the other hand, if we do tomography, which means that we kind of cut uh, different slices through this box, we will be able to figure out exactly how these uh, uh, toys are located with respect to each other. So this is exactly what we're doing, but instead of physically slicing through this uh, system, we're slicing through it in the space of uh, uh, polarization states. Okay, and uh, this is how conceptually the experiment looks like. You basically have to illuminate it with uh, uh, some uh, light, okay, with polarized light. You can rotate your polarizer and change the polarization state of the incident light. And then you can collect a scattered light also using a, uh, a, an analyzer. So essentially you would uh, uh, pick up a quantity which is uh, 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 proportional to, the, uh, to this uh, uh, quantity which is uh, basically how the, polar uh, the polarizability spectrum projects onto the polarization of incident light and polarization of the uh, collected light through, through the analyzer. And then you can look at the final feature, I quantify it by basically just taking a derivative of this scattered intensity with respect to the frequency, and where it's large, I can, I can say that the final resonance is strong. So I can actually plot this quantity as a function of the uh, polarizer angle and analyzer angle and find that it's maximized for certain positions of the polarizer and uh, uh, analyzer. And uh, uh, what I'm going to define is the position of the quantum dot with respect to this nanoparticle. I'm, go uh, I'm going to call it a FANO axis. So this is the axis along which the polarization spectrum contains uh, these uh, uh, poles uh, corresponding to the excitonic resonances of the quantum dot. So this is how, uh, I'll just repeat the slide, this is how it looks for two quantum dots. So if one quantum dot 
resonates at 550 nanometers and another one at 570 nanometers. I can rotate polarization of the incident light and the FANA feature will be maximized for one point at uh, uh, 180 degrees. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, well, in, uh, in the experiment, of course, everything comes from top and is collected uh, uh, from, uh, uh, fr uh, fr from the top. So we didn't have that problem because well, we only had up. We didn't, uh, uh, we didn't have down. Or, or do you mean in the, uh, or do you mean in the uh, polarization uh, 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 plane? So, 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 you're, so you're saying that uh, there will be some ambiguity between this uh, dot being here and uh, uh, being down there. So in the actual experiment, we actually had some additional constraints that allowed us to uh, uh, eliminate that. But, 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 but you're right. If you just have a quantum dot and for some reason they can be placed uh, uh, down here, then, then there will be uh, an ambiguity. But it's an ambiguity uh, only in a sense of uh, plus, uh, 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 say, 10 degrees and uh, minus 10 degrees. You will not con confuse 10 degrees with 12 degrees, for example. So, uh, uh, well, we didn't have quantum dots. We, we are starting to work on this, but uh, 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 those experiments were not done yet. So the object that we used is a plasmonic rod. So this rod was taken to have such a length, in this particular case, 180 nanometers, that it doesn't support any bright resonance. So the bright resonance of an antenna is basically an antenna which is uh, half a wavelength long. So if you want to have an antenna which is uh, uh, half a wavelength long of this length, 180 nanometers, then your resonant uh, light would have to be at 1.1 micron, and silicon detector simply does not detect that. The, uh, uh, the second resonance is the so-called dark resonance, so it corresponds to an antenna that has one wavelength across it. So this uh, resonance does not have any electric dipole, so it's uh, truly dark. And uh, using uh, uh, AFM manipulation, my colleague, Elaine Lee, was able to basically roll this uh, uh, plasmonic particle on top of the nanorod and create this uh, uh, configuration. So this is the experimentally taken spectrum uh, when two particles are far apart, right? You just have a very broad band scattering by the plasmonic particle. And this is when they're on top of each other. You see a very clear uh, FANO feature. So it's, uh, it's all, uh, all the effects are quite large. They're, they're not very subtle. Okay, so, uh, well, how do we figure out where this rod and the uh, particle are contacting each other? So again, it's a relatively simple experiment. So this uh, uh, system is illuminated from the side and then scattered light is uh, uh, collected by an objective that has an analyzer in front of it. And we can vary the polarization of incident light and also the polarization of the uh, scattered light. Okay? So in the first uh, experiment, only the polarization of the incident light was uh, uh, varied and uh, unpolarized light was collected. So as you can see, as the position of the polarizer is changing, you basically proceed from a very strong fan of feature to almost a negligible uh, fan of feature. And uh, uh, you can actually plot this data as a function of the uh, incident polarization. And in the second experiment, we used fixed polarization of incident light, but we varied the uh, uh, polarization of collected light. And once again, you can go from a very prominent fan of feature to almost no fan of feature. And these two numbers are essentially uh, uh, are, uh, sufficient in order to uh, calculate the contact point between, these, uh, uh, between the nanorod and the uh, plasmonic particle and also the orientation of the nanorod in the plane. So, so here you may ask, uh, well, isn't there, again, some ambiguity, right? We're only collecting 
two numbers, which are the uh, maxima uh, for uh, incident and scattered, uh, uh, for the polarization of incident and scattered light, but we're actually predicting three numbers, which is the uh, two angles of the contact point and the orientation of the nanorod. So uh, the ambiguity is removed by the fact that we have an underlying substrate and we know what the diameter of the rod is, so we sort of know what is the uh, uh, latitude of the, of the contact point, and that allows us to uh, eliminate this ambiguity. So, so this, uh, uh, this result, uh, and I'm going to show how accurate it is, can be verified. So for example, you can rotate the whole system and eliminate it from the 180 degrees uh, opposite direction and do your own extraction again. And if the two extractions agree with each other, then you're in good shape. So one uh, take home point here is how accurately, five, five minutes for what? Oh, without questions, right? Are you sure? Okay, well then, uh, <laughs> well, that me, uh, then let me just very quickly say that uh, uh, one can estimate the accuracy of uh, determining the contact point between the rod and the nanosphere. And it turns out that you can do this measurement with an accuracy of only uh, 20 nanometers, okay? Which is really amazing. It's really as, uh, as high as you would possibly aim because the diameter of the rod itself is 22 nanometers. So the whole definition of a contact point can only be applied with that accuracy. And this is a far field measurement which allows you to achieve a, a resolution which cannot even be achieved using near field measurements. Okay, let me, uh, let me skip through this and go straight into uh, topological stuff. I know some people are interested in it. So uh, <clears throat> uh, I, I mentioned earlier that we're going to use what we call uh, bionisotropic metamaterials. So bionisotropic metamaterials imply that the, uh, that the B vector, the magnetic uh, 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 inductance vector, uh, is not just proportional to H, but it also has some contribution from the electric field. And likewise, the dielectric displacement, the D vector, is not just epsilon times E, which is what we always teach in uh, 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 undergraduate electricity courses, but in fact, it can have an additional contribution from the magnetic field. And the reason this is possible is because the metamolecules that we're using do not have any symmetry. So even if you apply magnetic field for example, in this direction, in X direction, there are going to be some currents induced in the ring which will give rise to the, uh, 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 to the electric uh, dipole moment and vice versa. So you can have this interesting coupling between electric and magnetic fields. Well, I will have to skip through the uh, crash slide. It basically reminds you what are the uh, possible uh, electronic topological insulators that are there. Uh, there are, uh, 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 some of them require magnetic fields, so those uh, rely on the quantum hole state, and uh, they basically support what is called edge states, so these are one-way states of uh, uh, electron conduction that propagate along the interface between insulator and, uh, 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 and the magnetized, for example, uh, semiconductor. There is a, a, an emerging field, and you already heard a very nice uh, introduction from uh, uh, Victor Galitsky about uh, uh, quantum spin hole effect and uh, topological insulators. So those do not require any magnetic field. Instead, they rely on, uh, uh, on the photon, uh, uh, on, on the electron spin to produce local magnetic fields that can uh, then interact with their orbital motion and produce spin polarized currents, which means that uh, you, know, you will have currents flowing this way, but only for spin up particles, and currents flowing that way, but only for spin down particles. So is it possible to emulate something like this in photonics? It turns out uh, it is possible, but one has to do a little bit of contriving, because the one half spin of an, uh, of an electron is not so easy to emulate uh, in, uh, um, uh, in photonics. So I'm going to skip through other approaches of uh, uh, making uh, uh, topological insulators. So Misha contributed to some of this uh, uh, effort, which was now experimentally realized. And there was also a very interesting work by uh, Moti Segev's group. And this is the work from our group. So I will go straight uh, into our work. 
and uh, just briefly uh, outline how one can emulate an electron spin using bionisotropy. So, so let's imagine that we have a, a material which consists of columns of metamaterial. So we think of this material as a metacrystal because it has inclusions, each of which consists of a bionisotropic metamaterial. Okay? And uh, bionisotropy enters through this coupling coefficient, which is basically coupling between X component of the electric, uh, uh, of the electric field and Y component of the magnetic moment and uh, vice versa. So one can go through very simple uh, Maxwell's equations, right? You have always seen uh, wave equations, so this is, uh, uh, this is all very simple. The right-hand side is something that you may not be very familiar with, and this comes about from this bi-anisotropic effect. So electric field and magnetic field end up coupled through this uh, term. Uh, one, uh, uh, fortunate, uh, in one fortunate circumstance, when the transverse electric and transverse magnetic fields, which means by transverse electric we mean electric field pointing in Z direction, transverse magnetic means magnetic field is pointing in this direction, when these two modes propagate with the same propagation constant, which means that the uh, <coughs> epsilon and mu uh, components of the epsilon mu tensor are matched to each other, it turns out that one can construct these uh, superpositions of the electric and magnetic field that play the role of uh, uh, spin states. Okay, spin states in a sense that uh, if you apply time uh, uh, reversal to the plus state, you're going to get a minus state, and if you apply uh, time reversal to the uh, minus state, you will get a plus state. And as you can see, it is a little bit different than it is for electrons because there is no minus sign for, uh, for one of the uh, reversals. But it turns out that this is not important. And it turns out that for each of these states, we can derive a modified uh, wave equation which does not couple to other spins. So both spin states, and uh, again, these are contrived spin states. They only exist under this narrow, uh, for this narrow class of uh, photonic materials, which we call spin degenerate metamaterials. You can have this uh, separation between uh, spin states. And uh, uh, well, just uh, since uh, I'm running out of time, let me just uh, uh, quickly show what this implies. It implies that if you put together two uh, different uh, uh, photonic topological insulators, so one of them has a bionisotropy, another one doesn't have any bionisotropy, but its uh, uh, period is matched in such a way that, the, that its gap is coincident with a topological gap produced uh, in the topological insulator, you see the emergence of these edge states. So these edge states propagate along the interface between these uh, photonic crystals. And it turns out that even if you mess up this crystal, for example, by putting some of the, uh, some of the lower crystal, inserting it into the upper crystal, and vice versa, light is actually going to nicely flow uh, through it. And uh, let me just show you how this happens. I mean, it's not a... Okay, uh, instructive movie. It just shows how light flows around uh, this, uh, uh, this disorder. Now, uh, as I told you, this is a very contrived situation. It's very difficult to design these metamaterials using uh, 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 split ring resonators and so on, but it turns out that there is a much, much simpler realization of it, and it's the so-called uh, uh, bed of nails uh, structure. So it basically consists of a metal plate with a bunch of uh, nails connected to it, and you can connect a nail to the upper plate or you can connect it to the lower plate. And depending on which uh, plate you connect it to, you are actually going to get a different uh, uh, topological state. So uh, when you have these gaps, you open up a topological uh, gap which supports surface waves that flow along the interface between these two uh, uh, bed of nail uh, structures. And uh, these, uh, 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 these states are indeed topologically protected in a sense that they are not uh, really uh, deflected or backscattered by any disorder, where by disorder we mean the size of the gap between the plate and the pin could be varied significantly, for example, from two centimeters out of 10 to one centimeter to zero centimeters. So it's a huge variation of the gap between the plate and the pin, but nevertheless, this disorder doesn't really do anything bad to you. And uh, uh, 
there is a uh, significant difference between conventional surface waves, which are called the uh, TAM states. So you can create surface waves in a conventional photonic crystal without any topology involved. And these will be also localized states, but their dispersion relation will be very different from the topologically protected uh, edge states. And their behavior, their ability to flow, for example, around sharp interfaces is also very different. So one can make a sharply turning interface like this and launch a topologically protected wave. And for almost all frequencies, uh, it will be transmitted almost uh, 100%, uh, 80 to 100%. Whereas if you have a surface TAM state, the situation will be very different. You really have to hit a resonance of this band in order to get 100% transmission. Otherwise, you get almost nothing because everything gets reflected of the interface. Okay, so uh, let me conclude by saying that there are lots of open questions. For example, one very interesting thing to do would be to try and emulate many body effects in topological insulators, which is still a very open area in condensed matter physics. In uh, photonic topological insulators, this is relatively easy to implement because we can use nonlinear elements. For example, in microwaves, we can use varactors, and uh, there are lots of uh, uh, nonlinear elements in the visible part of the uh, spectrum to emulate some of these uh, many body uh, effects. One can also look at combining magneto optics and bionisotropy where you partially break time reversal symmetry and see if topological protection can uh, indeed persist. So let me thank you for uh, staying with me and let me thank, uh, thank all the members of the group who contributed to this work. Okay, so, so, so this is a very good question. So the, uh, the, uh, the magnetoelectric tensor, of course, has nine components, right? So when I said that it's a contrived situation, we are taking advantage only of two components, and the other chiral components are assumed to be zero. If you don't set them to zero, you will be able to emulate other spin-orbit couplings. For example, you can emulate Rajba spin-orbit coupling the coupling that I needed here is the one that gives rise to this uh, to, to topological insulation. But other uh, chiralities can also contribute. Just a, a brief comment on your mock-up of the electron spin. If you, if you have E plus I H, you actually have a mock-up of the photon wave function, which is something Marlon Scully and his golden board were working on maybe 10 years ago. It, 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 it could be, yeah. Okay, let me, <laughs> let me think of it. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, in, in, in well, I mean, for, for, for example, this bed of nail structure is extremely simple, right? I mean, uh, we, we're making it, so our first approach was just to go to Home Depot and get some screws and just uh, screw them into metallic plates. And uh, uh, they, they do show these uh, topologically uh, protected states, which are uh, uh, immune to certain kinds of disorder, meaning the length of your uh, 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 screw, for example. So it's a pretty crude, uh, I mean, we don't, we, uh, we don't have to substitute, for example, straight screws by wiggly screws, right, uh, to get topological protection. So it's, uh, it's relatively robust. But, but, but you are right, as I said, it is a somewhat contrived situation in the sense that only certain uh, uh, components of the uh, uh, epsilon and uh, 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 magnetoelectric tensor are kept. And, uh, It, 
it's uh, uh, it's 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 pretty robust. So so for example, if these uh, nails extend all the way down, you you have enough freedom. So you have spacing between rods, and you also have spacing between plates, and that's enough basically to have a fourfold uh, degenerate uh, uh, Dirac point here. So these are transverse electric and transverse magnetic modes. So you can match both their frequencies at the K point. Uh, they're actually mathematically obliged to have a Dirac point, but not necessarily at the same frequency. But you can make them have a Dirac point at the same frequency, and you can also match the slope. So you, you have enough degrees of freedom to, to have this, uh, this kind of a situation. Yeah. <laughs>